And, you know, from my understanding, it's not just babies who were born and died because of some health issue. A lot of it is babies who were born either malformed or with um, some kind of disorder that they they were going to be a, a, handi a handicapped child. And they don't believe in that. They don't believe in... Tucked away from prying ice for 70 years, this cemetery holds the remains of infants and stillborn babies who were born into the FLDS community. Many of these infants didn't survive long after birth, often due to lack of adequate medical care and the stringent beliefs of the sect. It's Fundamentalist Friday, and we're talking about the FLDS Baby Cemetery. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to Profiling Evil. I hope you're going to take a moment, hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell, do everything that you need to do there. And please consider sharing us with your friends. Now, today, as part of Fundamentalist Fridays, we're delving into the FLDS location that's always left me feeling just a little bit somber. This is the chilling aspect of FLDS history, a place that's known as Babyland to some, or the Baby Cemetery. Let's explore some of the heartbreaking truths buried beneath the surface. In the secluded community of Short Creek, now known as Hilldale, Utah, and Colorado City, Arizona, a place that's nestled in the rugged canyons of Utah, just south of Zion National Park, Life came and went for many members of the Fundamentalist Church, the FLDS. Here, polygamy was not only a religious doctrine, it was a way of life. And the leaders of the FLDS Church taught their members that plural marriage was sacred. Sacred like scriptures or even their God. Among these devout followers, a silent killer lurked unseen and undetected until it would strike with merciless efficiency. The killer came to be known as Fumaris disease, a rare genetic disorder that silently plagued the community and sadly claimed lives of children and adults with alarming frequency. Yet this isolated community kept the secret and their lifestyle shrouded in secrecy, masked by a fervent belief that faith alone could conquer all, but it didn't. You know, as an investigator in the Attorney General's office, I came to this community on a regular basis, trying to better understand the community and help those members understand that government truly was there to help if they were being victimized and they wanted to leave. Rarely would anyone talk to me, and each time I came to Short Creek, somehow I found myself gravitating toward the baby cemetery. It was because of the ghost stories, and they troubled me deeply. You know, there were no cemetery records then or now about the children who were buried there. There was only word of mouth that suggested that there were more than 250 babies that had died shortly after birth and laid beneath the red clay soil that's there. There were no records of the birth of the baby and no records of the death of the baby. On paper, they would have never existed. <laughs> you know, from time to time, though, I'd see somebody in the graveyard dressing one of those little hallowed pieces of ground. And I knew that while there wasn't a written record, there was a, an, <laughs> there was a record etched deep into their hearts. I think the pain of losing a child was very real for those mothers and probably most of those fathers there, if not all. Each story was similar and different at the same time, like the story of a girl that I'm going to call Rachel. She was married off to an older man at a tender age and soon became pregnant, bringing a little boy that she named Samuel into the world. Within hours of his birth, her world was shattered and Samuel died. In minor cases, you know, the local midwife was capable of bringing these newborns into the world. But when catastrophes happened, or if that child was malformed, 
there was nothing medically that could be done to save their lives. And questions always arise or arose of whether they wanted them saved. Doctors from the outside world were viewed with suspicion and their intentions were seen as threats to the purity of the community. This was all because of a rare genetic disorder called fumarase disease. And because of fumarase, Samuel died, like many other children. Fumarase disease has disproportionately affected the polygamous community, and most experts attribute this to these interfamilial marriages that occur in these close societies. Those afflicted with the disease experience a buildup of toxins that attack the body's cellular function. Some people who suffer from fumarous disease, and I hope I'm saying this right, folks, I've heard it a dozen times, may experience developmental delays, intellectual disability, seizures, movement disorders, and ultimately death. The belief among those who live in the community is that most of the babies here didn't survive for more than a few days, many for only hours. The reluctance to engage with outside authorities, including medical professionals and researchers, hindered efforts to address what was really going on until late. These underlying genetic disorders are now starting to come to light and be studied more and more. Today, there's more outside influence coming into Hildale and Colorado City's community. What was once only home to the members of the FLDS is now turned, and people who are not members of the faith now live in those homes that were once occupied by FLDS faithful. That's because Warren Jeffs declared from his prison cell that the FLDS members should relocate to other areas in the world. He said this is necessary because of all these evil influences from the outside world coming in and destroying their community. But with this influx of outsiders and more transparency in the community comes more insight. Loving parents who are concerned can now be educated about the genetic condition caused by fumarase. There's awareness campaigns, sensitivity, genetic testing, and counseling that's available. And as more dialogue occurs, A culture of inclusivity is starting to occur. You know, I met with my buddy Sam from the podcast Growing Up in Polygamy there again. And you know, we've been traveling around looking at things. Please make sure you're going over to Sam's and Melissa's uh, site and subscribing to Growing Up in Polygamy. But Sam lived in this community for the first 18 years of his life. His family actually built a home across the street from the baby cemetery, and he and many of his 34 siblings often wandered around and wondered about the children who were born inside there. They got bits and pieces. In their mind, though, the leaders kind of thought they didn't need to know so many different things. But I thought you might enjoy watching our discussion and catching some of that interaction that occurred as he talked about life there as a member and I talked about life as an investigator. Well, Sam, like I was mentioning in our earlier video, this place has always been a concern to me from an investigative standpoint because the ghost stories we heard over the years that were uh, were that children were coming into the FLDS, of course, massive amounts of children being right. born out here, okay. and um, that in some cases, children were either stillborn or dying uh, when they were still in infancy and never documented as living on this planet but we worried that maybe they were being buried here or elsewhere tell me a little bit about the baby cemetery because we're we're actually across the street from the place you grew up yes we are and so this was something i would look out my window and see or as i was running up and down the street here i would see on a daily basis and yes, it's just that. It is a baby cemetery. Just up the street here, not too far, is the Hildale Clinic, which is where all of the babies, or at least the majority of the babies here, were born from uh, Aunt Lydia was her name, that was the, the nurse there that would help. The she baby. was the midwife. She was the midwife, okay. yes. And she did have a lot of training, and I feel, I feel that she did a great job. But this cemetery specifically was for those babies that died before they were born or died immediately after they were born. 
And there was actually one from my own family that was buried here as well. Not from my mother, but one from another mother that was born or buried here. So it would have been a step child. Step child, yes. And that was before I was born that that happened. But as far as documenting the, the birth goes, that I don't know for sure. I, know, I do know, however, that during the time the Warren Jeffs has been in prison, there have been a lot of children, even those that are living today, that have grown up into teenagers even, some of them, or, or almost teenagers, that aren't documented. Isn't that amazing? So that's a very scary. That means thought. they can uh, not get Social Security. They can't get a driver's license. They don't even have a birth certificate. They don't have a birth certificate. Right. Yes, and there are places that are specifically for that issue, that they're trying to help these children that do end up, in some cases, leaving the church, and they don't know where to go. They have nowhere to turn. They don't know how to get a job, get documentation, any of that kind of thing. There are places like the Dream Center here that are helping those people get the right, get in front of the right, uh, I guess, authorities to get that stuff sorted out. You know, as we uh, look at this area from the drone, we're kind of, you can see that we're kind of moving slowly side to side along a row of graves. And and uh, while there are a number of graves that have markers and other kinds of things on them, there are a lot of graves that simply only have a small metal bracket saying, this is who lies here, baby right. Johnson or baby Barlow or right. whatever. Uh, and, and now as we pan up and we look at this from a more of a, um, satellite view, we see how massive this really is. Do you have any idea how many babies are buried here? Oh, I have no clue. I mean, you see, you look out and you do see a lot of markers, and most of the markers have the name and the date of how, how long they lived, which in most cases was, you know, a day or, or less. And, you know, so it's hard to say, though. I don't know if there's more babies buried here that don't have a marker. It, it's It's impossible to know. Yeah, and, and there, I haven't been able to find an actual record like you see in most legitimate cemeteries right. of each plot. I don't think there is. Yeah, yeah, not, crazy. Not that I know of. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Now, your father was mayor of this community for a lot of years, and we're going to go over to City Hall in a minute and chat and share some of the experiences yes, yes. from there. I'm looking but, forward to seeing what your your experience with <laughs> that was, because that uh, that's interesting to me. I know that my father was meeting with a lot of outside people being the mayor of the city. So I'm sure you dealt a lot with him. Yeah, I did have a lot of meetings with him and many of the other leaders, including, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of weird to say, I, I knew Ruin Allred, I knew Ruin Jeffs, I, yes, wow. I knew Warren Jeffs, and uh, of course, I wasn't their favorite person to right. show up and visit, <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, now, uh, as over my left shoulder, on the side of this home is the are the letters UEP standing for the United Effort Plan, and this has been a real interesting thing. It became a huge piece of controversy in 2005 when the state of Utah took over the UEP and put it under a conservatorship where someone right. had to control all of the assets, which reached um, hundreds of millions, oh, if yes. not billions, of dollars. It was a lot of money. And I remember that time when the state came in and took over the trust. And at that time, Warren Jeffs had completely taken ownership of the trust. He had been controlling everything. He had been taking businesses away from some of the well-known men here in the community. And because the church and the trust owned everything, he forced everyone to sign everything over to him and the trust, which he was in charge of. So when the state came in and took over that trust, you can imagine how that made us feel. We were we were just livid to think that the state could come in and just take over our whole church, is what we were told, right? Which was the assets of the church, not our beliefs. And and I wonder what that was like for you. Do you are were it you was, familiar with that? It was troubling. In fact, I remember going to the offices in downtown Salt Lake City of the conservators that were responsible, the lawyers that were responsible for the trust and talking with them, especially as it evolved and they started allowing former FLDS or current FLDS members to reclaim property that they had built and finished, sometimes for pennies on the dollar, but there was a requirement that they had to finish it and get it tax roll ready. Right. And, and most would not do that because in their opinion, 
it was it was consecrated and given to God. And who are you to try to sell it back to me? Who are you to try to sell it back to me? And Warren Jeffs was telling them to not pay taxes. And so that made it complicated as well for even some of the families that probably would have just said, hey, here, I'm going to pay the back taxes. I want to own my house. Warren Jeffs said no. Yeah. And of course, because they think he's talking for God, they felt that it wasn't their it wasn't their place to say no to Warren Jeffs. Well, I've talked about this story a few times, but it needs to be told over and again. It makes me think when I look at this of the unknown soldier in Arlington National Cemetery. And and I think about these names that are of children who have long since been forgotten. Each of these graves represents a life cut short and a story that's gone untold. You know, as I was thinking about how each of you might be feeling as you're watching this week's video, I wondered if you had shock and sadness on your list of emotions that you're feeling. I decided to call up my dear friend and cold expert, Dr. Yanya Lalek, and I asked her what her thoughts were as she explored some of this imagery with me because I wanted to get her reaction, thinking it might mirror even some of yours. Let's watch that discussion and uh, the video. Well, hey, everyone, I'm here with Dr. Yanya Lalek, and she is an expert when it comes to cult behavior. In fact, when I was writing my book, Deceived, you were the first person I reached out to, Yanya, to say, hey, how far off base or how close are we getting to things? I, I, I'm so grateful you took time today. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm a little tired of the rain here in Northern California, but other than that, I'm good. Well, what what is your rain and a little discomfort is packing our mountains with snow right now. So I'm really grateful that you're having to deal with it because it's uh, coming over pretty quick and dropping on the mountains here. But uh, Yanya, I've talked to you on many occasions. I know that you have experience talking with survivors from the FLDS group down along the Utah-Arizona border. And a, a few days ago, I went out there with a young man who is was a former member of the cult down there. He has 34 siblings, four mothers. His father was a key figure in the community, was the mayor of Hildale. And for many years, when I was with the attorney general's office, he, I would go head to head with him in his office as we tried to get more transparency into the polygamous community and the programs in the attorney general's office. And so I thought it would be fun to take this young man, Sam is his name, and he's now an adult with two children of his own, uh, left polygamy at age 18, is now in his uh, 30s, but he has found success in his life. Uh, and I thought, let's go to let's go to Hilldale, Colorado City together, and we'll stop at each location that troubled me as an investigator and you tell me from your perspective what happened. And one of those places was the baby cemetery. And of course, on the video, I've already explained uh, what the baby cemetery was established for and what it has. I wanted to kind of get some of your thoughts. But our concern from the state level all the time was that children are undocumented in that community, at least back then. And there were many tykes, in my opinion, that were um, born, died, and, and most of the children in this cemetery are probably less than a week old and uh, never heard from again, except for maybe the little markers like we see in the distance on this image or that we're going to see as we look at the video a little further. And it worried us from a state perspective of the fact that children were dying and never recorded as living. What are, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I first heard about this um, when I was interviewing uh, FLDS survivors uh, for my book on children who grew up in cults, uh, Escaping Utopia. And, I, I mean, I was just horrified at, at just the thought of it, much the less that this is a reality, that this place actually exists. And despite how awful it is, it's it's someplace I've always wanted to go to. Um, and, you know... From my understanding, it's not just babies who were born and died because of some health issue. A lot of it is babies who were born either malformed or with um, some kind of disorder that they they were going to be a a, handi a handicapped child, and they don't believe in that. They don't believe in 
people like that. So it's um it it's just criminal. It's criminal. And and you can imagine what what that must have felt like for the mothers of those babies. Uh to know that they were just shunted off to this mystery cemetery somewhere. You know, and and this cemetery is is just a few blocks east of the Hilldale City offices. And there are no records showing which child is in which plot. In fact, I suspect there are many plots that have over time been forgotten and right. they may not even know that there are remains that right. are there. But I uh, took the former bodyguard to the uh, prophets, Warren Jeffs, actually Leroy Johnson and uh, Rulin Jeffs wow. out to the baby cemetery with me. And I did it like on what I called my ghost ghost tour because I said, I want to know about the ghost stories and I want you to respond to them. And this was 30 years after and we, we were mortal enemies during those years. Right. But a few years ago, I reached out to him and invited him to have lunch and kind of find if there's a middle ground. But as we went out there, I was really touched because as we were walking, he stopped and he pointed at a grave and said, this, this one is mine. And oh. it it was very tender for him. And so I know that uh, even though those babies to some families may have been, let's just move on and forget about the past for him, it was still very raw, but I wanted to play as, and I look forward to the time when you and I can go out there together and I can share you some of the things that I've learned over time. But I, I thought I'd pop the drone up and just fly through the area and look around a little bit. Wow. And so uh, this will give you kind of a sense of what that plot of ground looks like. Yeah, look at that. Mm. Yeah, there, and you know, you get some of these little markers. There, there's a little metal marker, or a rock is the marker. And uh, and is that is that like a little house? Um, let's see which which one what? the oh the second one. Well, it's oh called... no, it's a metal marker. In oh, fact, marker. if we were to okay. yeah. Okay. If we were to uh, zoom in on that a little I bit. I get it. Yeah, I get it now. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and so you see all these different levels oh. of uh, preparedness. And, and I wonder, you know, some of these little... Look at that. Oh, my tykes. God. Yeah. Isn't that oh. something to think of a child born, buried that way? I th You know, I swear to God, I don't know if I could go there. I'd have to bring a cartload of Kleenex. <laughs> And then look at some of these stones here, just a piece of cement that they scratched a name in. Canyon, yeah. I'm surprised they even have names. How big is that plot, Mike? So I would say this is probably three or four acres. Wow. Uh, they say that it has somewhere around 250 bodies buried in it. Again, mm. no information at all about... Yeah. Uh, who's buried where, like you would oh, see yeah. in a traditional yeah. cemetery. And uh, is there is there any kind of like groundskeeper or anything? N not that I'm aware of and not according to Sam, who lived there, grew up there and told me about it. And now you can start to see the massiveness of this thing. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, look at that one. Wow. Two of them. And uh here, I just kind of zoom up to catch the UEP on the side of the house. You've probably seen that photograph before, but uh, UEP stands for United Effort yeah. Plan. And, and who, is uh, that who owns this land <clears throat> at this pardon? point? Is that, is that who owns the land at this point? The UEP owned the land, yeah. <laughs> and uh, mm. But again, look at those little, well, in oh. fact, I'm going to just pause there for a moment. Look at those little stones around a tiny little mm -hmm. grave. Oh, my God. Oh. And when was this, Mike? Just recently? This was taken a few days ago. Oh, a few days ago. Oh, my God. Yeah. <clears throat> mm. You know, people say to me, I don't know how you do what you do, but I want to say to you, I don't know how you do what you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've I've found that as I get older, Yanya, <laughs> I don't I know that I don't have the intestinal fortitude for this job anymore yeah, because the emotion of it certainly <laughs> does get to me. Yeah. yeah. 
I've been doing this 35 years. I'm almost 79. And I cannot tell you. And still every week I hear of new cults. I hear of more child abuse. I mean, it's just so rampant. And now with the internet cults, it, 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 it's just exploding. That's incredible. But yeah, so when you think about the mindset that, that makes something like this right, and you look at these images, I, I just wanted a sense from you of, um, number one, kind of the mindset of what I consider to be generational mm -hmm. cult members who are right. raised in an ideology Right. And how much harder it is. Sometimes people want these things just broken apart versus I found much more success with a convert style group than a generational group. What What are your thoughts there? Oh, the generational stuff is really hard because, um, you know, with the generational groups that have this kind of abuse and secrecy and lack of transparency and God knows what all is going on. That's the only thing people know, especially when you have a group that's as like sequestered as what's happened with the FLDS, you know, and many other groups that are kind of just in the middle of nowhere. Although there certainly are ones that are in major cities and the same thing happens. But it's the, you know, the fourth generation, the fifth, they pass it down, the, the, maybe, maybe every so often someone gets away, they escape. Um, and they and they then they're shunned. They never see their family again. No one ever talks about them. You know, it's like so they're gone. That that's not going to make any dent in anything. Um, and it, and it just goes on and on. And and it's so so difficult to leave that kind of situation because you're raised to be terrified of the outside world. Uh, so you're afraid to go out there, even if you had the the resources, even the psychological resources to figure out how to get out there. And then you get out there and where do you go? I mean, the, the problem, I see this, this is one of my pet peeves. I see this as the number one public health issue in our country is people who are born and raised in cults. When they leave, we have absolutely no resources for them. So they can go to a domestic violence shelter, for example, and they'll get turned away because they don't qualify. Right. There's no educational, you know, they come out. Sometimes they don't know their real name. They don't have a birth certificate. They don't know if there's other relatives out there somewhere. They end up living on the streets. They end up, you know, surf couch surfing. They end up doing drugs, selling their bodies for sex. They don't know about how to get the GED and, and some kind of high school diploma. Most of them are homeschooled, which is why I'm opposed to homeschooling, because there really is no regulation. So in most of these groups, all they're learning is the cults, blah, 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 the cult leaders, you know, speeches over and over. And so, <clears throat> you know, how do they get a job? They don't know what a resume even is. I mean, it's just criminal what happens once they get out. And somehow many survive. Many don't. There's so many suicides. It's tragic. But many do survive. And, and they're a very special breed. <laughs> they're a very special gang of people. I mean, I've worked with many and their issues are somewhat different than, than someone who joined like I did, who joined as an adult. Right. So it's huge. <laughs> you know, it's interesting in, in talking with Sam, uh, uh, as we went through from place to place, uh, he, he would say things like, you need to understand. I looked at you as the devil mm -hmm. from government. You were everything that the outside world represented. And even the thought of going into the outside world meant that I would be sacrificing my eternal exactly. opportunities. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> when I was doing the interviews for my book, um, I interviewed, I think, 65 individuals who, who were born and raised in a cult and then left on their own, just got out of there somehow and tried to make a life for themselves. And Almost every single one of them, first of all, every single one of them said once they got out there, they just felt like they had landed from Mars. I mean, they just were, yeah. felt so out of place. But secondly, almost every one of them said they were so surprised how nice people were. Like, you know, they were expecting, you know, hell and damnation and, you know, to be beaten by people or I don't know what, you know, and it was like, oh, people are really nice. You know, they help you in the grocery store and they... <laughs> 
you know, help you across the street or whatever. Well, as I stand there among those tiny graves each time I visit, I feel like it's so essential that we remember these innocent little lives that were lost and that we reflect on the broader implications of unchecked power and religious extremism, because that's what led to this. And if you'd like to learn a little more about how seemingly intelligent people like this can be led into believing such wacky doctrines, read my book, Deceived, an investigative memoir of the Zion Society cult. You can find it at Profiling Evil, and I'll tell you what, until this series on Fundamentalist Fridays is over, I'll continue to sign them for no charge, just as a thank you for picking it up. Remember, the proceeds are going to help build a children's advocacy center. And I want to inform you of another great opportunity to learn about cults. You've had uh, just a few, few nights. In fact, last night I texted you because I finally sat down and watched the documentary on Netflix of Twin Flames. And Twin holy Flames. cow, what a story. But as we were texting back and forth, I learned something that I signed up for today that I thought <laughs> would be really neat if you'd share with everyone sure. because we want to encourage them to do it. And it's something they can do because they can jump in virtually. Right, exactly. So the documentary, <clears throat> excuse me, the documentary Escaping Twin Flames, which is on Netflix, is about a group called Twin Flames Universe. And basically it's run by a couple of con artists who um, <clears throat> promise you that they'll find your twin flame or your soulmate. And so people pay thousands and thousands of dollars to go to their courses and go to their workshops and have private sessions with them and blah, 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 blah. They have more than 50,000 followers on the internet. And occasionally they have actual meetings, you know, now that the pandemic, uh, now that we're not sheltered in. Time. So they would fix people up with awful, evil, abusive people. That was one thing. They, they have people work for them. They train them to be coaches, coaches, so that they charge people money, other people in their network, and then Jeff and Shalia, the leaders, get most of the money. So they're pretty much working for free, labor trafficking. And then, because they ended up recruiting so many young women, um, you know, in their 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever, uh, they didn't have enough men to match them up with. So now they are encouraging, or as I say, coercing, some of these women to have a sex change. And so some of them are having the surgeries, they're cutting off their breasts, they're taking hormones, they're growing little beards. And basically, there's a young woman named Keely, Gri Keely Griffin, who is sort of the main whistleblower and who's featured in the documentary. And uh, she was a very high-level person, so she left with all these videos. So there's real footage uh, in the documentary. But she and I have been invited to Michigan uh, next week, actually, February 22nd. Um, we'll be in Michigan for something called the National Writer Series, and people can attend live or they can sign on virtually. And everybody who buys a ticket, which I think are quite reasonable, they get a copy of my new book, uh, Take Back Your Life, whether you, whether you do it virtual or whether you're in person. And so we'll be talking on the stage, um, and then also I'll be doing a book signing, and Keely will be there to talk to people. And I think she's incredibly brave because I can tell you if it were me, I would not go to the, it's in the town literally right next door. To the, to the, well, well, we'll, we'll actually put a link down below, Yanya. Oh, and again, folks, I'd encourage you, uh, join me online because I'm going to be watching <laughs> this one actually from St. George because I'm going back out to the FLDS uh -oh. next week. <laughs> and this is another great opportunity to just remind you of profiling evil choir practice. Hey, everybody, look who I'm hanging out with. And uh, listen, I'm not attending choir practice, but I just wanted to tell you that you need to be watching Profiling Evil YouTube. Don't miss it. I'm telling you, there's something there for you every single time. I never miss. You shouldn't either. I appreciate those comments from Dr. Phil. And the thing that's exciting for me in our April episode is I'm going to have Dr. Lalek and Keely on choir practice with my other guests to talk a little bit about this idea of coercive mind control. So there you go, folks. In a weird sort of way, I hope that you found this video to be informative and worth viewing. 
Please put your comments down below and, and take the time to weigh in on each other's comments. I'm going to be reading and responding to some of them as well, and I look forward to what you have to say. Don't forget you can find Profiling Evil on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you like podcasts, make sure you're checking out Profiling Evil Podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. And while we're talking, make sure that you've signed up for the BOLO. That's our digital newsletter. It only comes out four times a year, and the only way you're going to get it is by signing up at ProfilingEvil.com. I only send it to those that request it. Next week, we're going to be exploring the FLDS's Civic Control Center and talking with Sam about his father, the former mayor of Hilldale. Well, thanks for your support, folks, and we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.